five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Secretary Johnson, thank you for being here today. Um, I want to take a moment and thank you and um, FEMA Administrator Fugate for traveling to Oso, Washington, the site of a massive landslide in my district that tragically took the lives of 43 people. I think you'll agree it's impossible to describe the scale of what happened without being able to be there to see it, and I appreciate you coming out. The support of the department through FEMA assistance has been very critical to everyone there, and as we continue with the recovery efforts, um, I look forward to continuing to work with you and FEMA to make sure that we have all the federal resources um, available to support the communities of Oso and Darrington and Arlington as they continue in this long rebuilding process. So thank you again. Um, I want to turn to the issue of immigration policy, which is particularly relevant in my district because we have the, the border with Canada, the northwestern border with Canada. Under federal law, um, right now CBP officers have the right to stop and conduct warrantless searches on vessels, trains, aircraft or other vehicles anywhere within a reasonable distance from an external boundary of the United States. Um, currently, federal agents from CBP operate in a 100-mile zone drawn from any land or sea border, and this distance was established by regulation over 60 years ago. And while this may be sensible in some areas, especially in the southern border, in Washington State, We've seen the Border Patrol set up checkpoints that disrupt commerce and hassle residents. I'm particularly concerned about racial pro profiling complaints that we've received during vehicle stops. and want to point out that last September in Washington State, the Border Patrol reached a settlement agreement in a lawsuit alleging that the agency was engaging in discriminatory conduct in its stops. Um, as the review of the, the Department's immigration policies moves forward, I'd ask you to take a close look at this. We need to provide our federal officers with the tools they need to keep our border safe and also keep our Customs and Border Patrol agents focused <clears throat> on their mission near the border. And so I wanted to ask for your commitment to review the 100-mile zone, whether this is a reasonable distance from the border, um, in particular for the northern border. Um, yes, I will take a look at that. I will also take a look at our <clears throat> enforcement activities generally. Um, at sea and elsewhere, it's a topic I'm interested in. As the head of this agency, as a lawyer, as a former prosecutor, um, <clears throat> I also want to comment on what I saw when I was in Oso. Um, I think all the members of the committee should appreciate the remarkable community effort that we saw the day we visited there. Um, private citizens, local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, state, enforce, state law enforcement, and just neighbors who had been at the site of the mudslide for like two weeks with no sleep, trying to help their neighbors, trying to find evidence of their loss. It was a really remarkable effort, and so I, I just wanted to note that as well. Thank you. Uh, and I hope that your constituents are in a better place uh, as a result, and um, please send them my regards. Thank you, I will. Um, also on Sunday, the New York Times reported that even as the federal government cracks down on undocumented immigrants and forbids um, businesses to hire them, it's relying on tens of thousands of immigrants each year to provide essential labor, usually for a dollar per day or less, at detention facilities. Um, and in Washington State at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma, a privately run detention facility, detainees led a hunger strike recently to protest their conditions, which included concerns about their severe undercompensation for the labor they provide um, to keep these facilities running and without protections afforded to other workers. Um, the, the vast majority of ICE det detention facilities are operated under contracts with private prison companies and county governments. Um, given, given that, is there any statutory or regulatory impediment that would preclude DHS from requiring these contractors to pay wages to detainee workers that are higher than a dollar per day? Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, this, my understanding of the program is that it's on a voluntary basis, but I am concerned about conditions of confinement at our facilities. This is something that I've spoken to you and Adam Smith about, in particular the one in Washington State. I sent a group from my front office out a couple of weeks ago to visit this facility when the hunger strikes had started there. 
and I intend to visit it personally myself along with other detention facilities. Um, in terms of the law and the legal requirements, that's something I'd want to look into. Um, thank you. I'd appreciate that because I have met with individuals who were released from the detention center in Tacoma, and they said um, that you know folks were put in solitary confinement for work stoppages, um, failing to show up and to cover shifts, and so clearly that does not describe a voluntary scenario. Um, but um, compensation has been important when they aren't. They feel like they haven't had adequate food and they need to work to get enough money to buy things from the commissary and a dollar per day does not help them out very much. So um, I'd appreciate your feedback on that going forward and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, thanks the gentlewoman and recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's, 